Now, moving on to the really exciting part. We just finished VBS, y'all. It was awesome. It was so good. I want to thank Leanne and her team. Give them a hand for all the hard work they did. <laughs> Fantastic event. <clears throat> One of the highlights, if not the highlight of the year for so many of us. And uh, God moved in a powerful way. And one of the ways was several people made some decisions, and one of those has requested to be baptized today. So on short notice, we filled this up. This water is 31 degrees, and I'm kidding, it's not. It's, it's very, very nice and toasty. And Jacob Paul is coming today. So Jacob, come on up, my friend. We're going to baptize him. He has made his profession of faith. And we have, we have a proud, proud family here on the second row. And this was a decision that was made. He's made his profession of faith in Christ and we are so excited. This family is actually, it's bittersweet for us because they are moving, God is moving them to Germany. So it is going to be a big commute every week to come back to Potter's Hand. They're going to do that. It's going to be fantastic. All right, this is my buddy Jacob right here. So he's talked with me. I've had a great talk with, with his father. And today we mark an event. What baptism does is this is not what saves us. This is the public affirmation of the Christ change has already been in our heart. Does that make sense? We are publicly identifying with him. When we go under the, 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 the baptismal waters, you will actually hear me say, it's kind of hard because you hear the splashing and people be clapping, but you will actually hear me say, buried in the likeness of Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. And that's what this symbolizes. So today, I am so proud as your pastor, as your friend, now as your brother in Christ to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and come in. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Woo! Oh, man. Proud of you, buddy. You did it. That's awesome. Let's pray together, shall we? God, we thank you for this awesome day and for this sweet family. Thank you for the way you've moved in our lives. We give you all glory, all credit. Father, we pray that we would worship you today and continue to focus on you and to exalt you and to lift you up, knowing when you are, you will draw all men to yourself. We love you. We pray in your powerful name. Amen. Morning, church. Woo! Before the advent of photography had really taken on, there was a famous Christian artist by the name of Frederick Church. Some of you might have heard of him. Some of you may have seen some of his incredible works that are hanging now in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Fine Art. Some of his most incredible masterpieces are there. And this man loved Jesus. But because photography hadn't quite taken off, he was determined to do something to point people to Christ. So what he did is he did the unthinkable. He loaded up what he could find for sketchbooks, and he took a perilous journey from New York all the way down to the jungles of South America. And he went into the foothills of the Andes Mountains. And his job, in his mind, was to try his best he can to capture all these incredible vistas and landscapes that none of us would ever dare go to. So he brought his sketchbook, and when he got down there, he was sketching and making all these great designs and stuff. And he's like, man, this is breathtaking. The glory of God is overwhelming me. I can't wait to get back. And Lord, help me paint a fair approximation of what I'm seeing, because your grandeur is taking my breath away. And he loved the Lord. So he got back to New York, and he got all his sketches, and he painted a masterpiece. One that is so famous, it still hangs today, right alongside the famous picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware. That will show you what the art community thinks of this, okay? And it was called The Heart of the Andes, and this is what it looks like, okay? It is a beautiful, breathtaking vista. And what he did is he set it up in this big tent just outside of uh, Central Park, and he charged everybody a whopping wait for it, 25 cents to come walk through. And people paid it. Back then, that was like a dollar or something. I don't know. It was a lot. And they came, and they lined up around the block, and they wanted to see it. And it was, people were moved. They even brought opera glasses so that when they looked at it, they felt like they were looking through the woods at this panoramic vista. And it was breathtaking. It was awesome. But what a lot of people missed when they looked at this was if you zoom in right down here, this is what you see. Pow! because he wanted everything he did to reflect the cross of Christ, to show these sojourners kneeling at the foot. And that may be in all his paintings. I don't know much about him, but I know this is an, an incredible story because his goal was to show people a glimpse of a faraway land that excited their imaginations. You see where this is going? God 
gives us his word, specifically the last two chapters of Revelation, to excite our imaginations. When things look dark, when things are depressing, and we, we just don't feel like we're, we fit in here because we were made for another world. When we start grasping God's majesty, when we start really catching a glimpse of what awaits you as a believer, you start behaving like citizens of another world. It starts to affect how you view people with love, with acceptance. Man, we're all in this together. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. Apart from him, <laughs> I'm, I'm a sad, sad wreck. I'm glad none of you knew me before I knew the Lord, back when I had big hair. I was on the stage rocking out, doing heavy metal stuff, Woo! pulling a muscle. When we study what God has for us, I'm telling you all, we begin to live like citizens of where our heart truly resides. When we study the book of Revelation, this is, we missed this. This is one of the few passages in all of the Bible where it mentions a specific blessing for those who study it. Read it for yourself right here in Revelation 1.3. It tells us that blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and those who take it to heart when it's written because the time is near. Three things, those who read it, those who hear it, those who study it. Today, you're doing a triple whammy. You're getting all three. You're going to leave this place triple blessed. This is so amazing because when we study what's to come, we see that God wins and Christ triumphs. We see Satan loses. All tears are wiped away forever. Sorrow, sickness, and death disappear like mist in the morning. And it charges us up no matter how depressed you may be right now. No matter how dark the world may look to many of us. No matter what bad news you're wrestling with. That prognosis that a family member just got. No matter what you season you may even find yourself in. There is hope. All we have to do is look up. And it helps us look out and live with a light that the lost world wants to know. And when we live this way, it changes. So to see the context of what we're about to read, to fully appreciate all that we're about to read in the last chapter of the last book in the Bible, we're going to do something weird. We're going to go to the very first chapters of the Bible, these perfect bookends. We're going to look at what God originally designed to remind us and see how many parallels there are of what's to come. This beautiful, perfect, Edenic paradise that, that apparently God made, something is going to happen that is awfully similar but better. But until somebody holds it up and you look at it side by side, you may not make the connections. But y'all, it is mind-blowing. I could not wait to share this with you because I learned so much just this week. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and we're going to look at some of these. And I'll, I'll welcome those on our online campus. If you're streaming, it's great to have you with us too. We're going to look, probably just get about one verse into this before we pause because there's some hidden gold right here off the bat. Verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. What? Wait a minute. He scooped up a handful of dirt, he breathed in it, and it came to life? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. There is so much going on right here. The Hebrew word used here for formed literally means the dust of the earth, like scooped up like a, like a potter at the wheel, making some masterpiece out of clay. That's what this refers to. This master craftsman, like God himself, is sitting at this potter's wheel, and he's literally forming the first unique man, creating him out of clay with tenderness, with intentionality. And don't miss this, with uniqueness. This is something I never knew until this week. God specifically used a word in his scriptures. When he says he breathed directly into the man, the Hebrew word there, that nephesh, is, is he is literally breathing life directly into the man, taking an active exhalation into his lungs. But here's the thing. He only did this with mankind. Everywhere else that you read, there's a separation between mankind and animal kind. Everywhere else, it merely says God gave life. Boom, and he gave life, and he gave life, and he gave life. But here, this first time, it says he breathed this nephash into their being. He breathed life into it. This separates us from the animal kingdom, okay? Now, hear me. I'm not like anti-animal. I love animals. I cuddle them. I pet them, and they are delicious. But there is a difference between humankind and animal kind. Jesus came to die to ransom us back. 
our soul so that we can be with him. That is a hidden truth and very powerful that the devil would love for us to say, you know what, why don't we all just, everything's equal. Your worth is the same as that oak tree out there. No, it's not. Your worth is the same as the spotted horn toad. No, it's not. Jesus didn't come to die for the spotted horn toad. I don't even know if that exists. I made that up. But you get the picture? There is a separation. God breathed life into you. He made man in our image. He's talking about you. You are special, and you are unique, and you are crafted with love and care. All right, let's keep reading. Look at verse 8 here. Keep reading Genesis 2. It says, Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden. Skip around to verse 11 here. It flowed around the entire land of Havilah where gold is found. And that gold of that land, get this, is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stones are also found there. The Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend it, to watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, bad things, right? You will surely die. Doesn't mean immediately, but death entered, and we all know what happened. But first, right away, don't miss this, guys. The world was absolutely gorgeous. It was perfect in every way, a literal paradise. We see so many great similarities. There's a great river, there's trees, there's natural wonders, there's things growing and treasures scattered everywhere in the forms of precious stones and minerals. And God would come down, we would later read, and walk with man and woman in the cool of the day and have fellowship with them face to face. And they didn't die. Remember later, it's like, Lord, let me see you. It's like, you can't, you'll die. My glory is so amazing. You and your fallen state, I will tell you, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to walk by, and I'm going to let you catch just the tiniest glimpse of my back as I pass by, and maybe you'll live. And by the way, your face is going to glow for like six months or something. See what I'm saying? The, the glory of God was so amazing, and it walked right there alongside man and woman in this beautiful paradise, and then something happened. The serpent. And we listened, and sin entered, and the curse came, and death, and it wrecked it, and it was awful. And just to make sure we never returned, God put cherubim, and he stationed them at the entrance to the garden with a flaming sword, it says, that moved every which way to keep them out. And we were exiled from the perfect paradise that God had created. So we look at this, and let's be honest, at first glance we go, Well, Satan won that round. Oh, well, I guess God is just going to have to give up on the idea of physical man and physical woman ruling and tending and subduing a physical earth. No. (laughs) We won't study it, but just so you know, in chapter 3 of Genesis, there's a promise made, a prophecy. It says something like this. There will be a man, a special God-man, that will come, will be born, and will crush that serpent's head. And it happened on Calvary. This was incredible. He reclaimed the fallen world, and and he made paradise lost on its path to paradise regained. Okay, that's the first two chapters. That sets up what we're about to read today when we see the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. Look with me at Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. A lot of scripture here today. Starting in verse 1, and it says... Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face. Are you guys getting this? And his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night, no need for lamps or suns. The Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. We don't fully grasp how awesome this is. 
We try, and today we're going to do our best. I mean, last week we began by thinking about what the exterior looks like and what is this new heavens and this new earth and how does it happen. And we see that there's this incredible, literal descending, it says, out of heaven, this new capital city, the new Jerusalem that is towering off in the distance. And imagine you're walking up to it and you see this thing towering and this is gleaming like pure diamond and gold that's translucent. It's so pure. And God's throne is inside and you can just see the light mesmerizing. You see it from far off and layers upon layers of ruby and sapphire and emeralds and foundations that we get excited. We're like, oh, I got a whole half carat of diamond. This is awesome. And it's going to be by the mile. We walk on it. It's so incredible. And we come up and we see stuff we've never talked about, like gates of pearl. Remember, this is not like, I got a pearl around my neck. The gates, we thought, just the rough size approximation, 250 feet tall, carved out of one solid pearl, each of 12 gates. That's a 250-foot wide pearl. What is it that makes pearls today? Is it clams? Is it oysters? Oyster? Y'all don't know. Cloisters. You've come by. All right. Imagine the size of that clam oyster. Okay? Bigger than this. Think about it. Now, I'm not saying there's going to be a little clam that costs up these things, but this is what God is going to do. It is so simple for him to blow our minds. This is good. We walk through these gates and we see that there's no moon. There's no sun. There's no need to light our way with little goofy curly Q fluorescent light bulbs. We don't walk into a dark corner and go, oh, it's so dark. Where's that energy efficient bulb? We don't have to worry about that because the lamb is radiant. Y'all, we don't get this. There's no even, there's not even a need for shadows. It permeates everywhere. This is so phenomenal. We walk in, our jaws will drop. Our eyes will go wide. Nothing can prepare you for what is waiting for you. Plus, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every socioeconomic status group will be there. It will be the ultimate display of unity, of culture, all coming together. And don't forget this, because a lot of us do. It's not going to be just us humans. For the first time ever, we will coexist and walk side by side with the angelic host, we forget that. We will literally be able to walk beside them on the main street and look up and see, oh my goodness, Tower, is that Gabriel? Is this the one that showed up and broke the news to Mary? Favored are you. And you'll see his face and you'll be like, why? no wonder people fell and worshiped him. And then you're like, oh, but compare that to the lamb. <laughs> now I understand why the angel said, do not worship me. I am a servant just like you. And it's not just us and the angels. It's the 144,000. It's the martyrs. It's the 24, the elders around the throne. There's all, this is going to be a countless number of the redeemed. And we will be able to walk up and down this main street and look at the holy concourse and be able to go and have culture and do amazing things. Y'all, we don't get this because the best we can come up with is Peak Fest. <laughs> this is going to be so much more than a, 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 a Peak Fest or some kind of uh, a holy block party for the ages. It is not even a shadow of what is to come. Flowing down the center of Main Street is this crystal clear river of life that originates from God's throne, not from the Rocky Mountains. This isn't a Coors commercial. This is the throne of God, watering trees that are bearing fruits. And, and you can come and you can eat them. And it says there are leaves that it will be for the healing of nations. You'll actually be able to, I don't get this because I'm not a salad guy, but apparently you leaf eaters, you greens, you're going to be able to eat those things. But here's the awesome part. Look at the original language. The word here, the Greek word used for healing is therapeia. Y'all, there's gold here. Do you know what that means? Do you know what, what word we get from that? Therapeutic. Therapeutic. Yes. Evidently, when we arrive, we won't have to eat for our perfect resurrected bodies. We don't have to, oh, I'm so hungry, I need a Snickers. It's not going to be like that. You are going to be able to eat for therapeutic reasons. You know what that means? For joy for fun, for pleasure, for fulfillment in God's presence. It will be totally optional, but it is there for therapeutic reasons. And in heaven, you can eat it. You don't get fat. It's in there. I mean, you got to look closer, but it, I mean, you can kind of get it. There's no more curse. When we see his face, it changes everything. And that last verse we just read says, we will reign with him forever and ever. What does that mean? This is forever. We can't grasp that. It's not just the millennium, that thousand years, that's going to be awesome. But think of this is forever and ever. To reign literally means to rule, to have dominion, to exercise stewardship over. Does that sound vaguely familiar? 
It's what we just read in Genesis when God came and he said, I want you to rule and steward creation and care for the animals. Remember, he brought them to him and said, name them. And then later he would say, you can eat them. Thank you, Lord, for filet mignon. And we have such an eerie similarity here of evidently we will continue to be God's image bearers in the new heavens, in the new earth. We will be able to create and still invent and still utilize resources and still make art and still use technology and culture all to the glory of God. We don't just go back to the Stone Age. And I think we have this mental picture. We just sit around and, man, I, I'm on a cloud polishing my halo. I wish I brought a magazine because I'm bored out of my mind. But it's not going to be like that. There is culture, and it is God's righteous plan for humanity to rule the new heavens and the new earth. And I'll show you the scriptures here in just a second that give us a hint at that. But somebody's came up and they've asked, Pastor, if we're there, I mean, what, how tall will we be? What size will we be? What, how old will we be? And I've heard preachers say, and they postulate, and, and, and they're fine to do that, but if it's not in Scripture, then you need to state it's just a theory, that everyone will be the perfect age. Everyone will be 33 years old. I've actually heard that because that was the age that Jesus died in his human form approximately. Now, there is no indication from Scripture that that is accurate. Could it be? Fine. Here, here's, here's the deal. When you read Scripture and you take it in context, the truth is there won't be age in heaven as we count age now. Remember, Age is a result of the curse. Age is a result of sin. That didn't happen before sin. Because of sin, we immediately began decaying, right? Notice the long lifespans, and as sin continued to propagate through the generations, they died off, and now we live three score and ten, and that's the average. So we, we think in age, and we think of these things, but that is a function of the decaying effects of sin. I don't believe that babies who die in infancy are babies forever in heaven. The same way I don't believe that people who are ravaged by cancer will appear emaciated in heaven. Heaven is a place of gain, not loss. It is a place of wholeness. It is a place of wellness. And I believe everyone will be fully restored with glorified, perfected bodies. So, so don't, don't think that you're going to have to be you know, walking around with your walker or struggling with these things. I don't pretend to know all the mysteries of heaven, but I promise you this. Heaven is a place of gain. It is a place of fulfillment, not disappointment. We don't show up, and this is the only promise I will make to you. We will not show up and go, huh, is that all? <laughs> Wah, wah, wah. It's not going to be one of those moments. It is going to be incredible. So what do we do forever with these awesome, ageless bodies? Oh, well, you just got a hint of it. Y'all remember this, besides eat. <laughs> There's a Krispy Kreme there, right, Pastor Matt? I'm not saying that. I am not going to say heresy from the pulpit like that. The story Jesus told of a man of noble birth, there's a guy who comes up and he tells this parable of servants who were given money to invest. To one of them, he said, don't take this. And the servant comes back and he says, master, I have doubled your money. And he says, awesome, well done, good and faithful servant. Go rule over 10 cities. And to another, he comes up and he says, master, I have invested, I've done this and, and I, I have given you a 50% increase on all that you entrusted to me, all of my talents. And he says, well done, you go rule over five cities. And another one came up and says, I didn't do squat. I sat on it. You can have it back now. I'm done. And it was taken from him as punishment. That parable is a picture of what heaven will be like. Grasp this. We will use our gifts to administer the new heaven and the new earth. They are not just for our selfish needs. They're not just to accumulate and heap up treasures for ourselves here. They're to bless others, to bless the Father, to bless the kingdom. And I, many theologians, they, they believe, and I tend to side with them, that bakers will still bake if they choose to bake. That teachers, if they want to teach, they can still teach. There's infinite things to learn. Singers will still sing. Scientists will still sing. Scientify. They will, whatever scientists do, right? I mean, think about it. All the new pl plant life, all the new things that grow, all the new things that they can study, botanists will be able to study that. And why would they not, when you have all of the limitless resources of heaven and the wonders of creation, gifted astronomers, maybe finally they're able to go from galaxy to galaxy and study God's wonders and bring back and tell of his glory? Why would they not? Remember, Resist the urge to think in human terms that we go back to the Stone Age in heaven. Doesn't mean that everything goes, oh, now we're just, uh, it's not going to be like that. I'm trying to expand your horizons to see heaven is a place of more, not less. 
I guarantee you, we're not going to be bored. We're not going to sit there and be fatigued. We will worship without distraction. We will serve each other and learn and laugh without fatigue or boredom, and we will fellowship without fear and exhaustion. It is going to be incredible. God made each of us with unique and special ministries and responsibilities, and I don't think upon going translated into our glorified bodies, he says, well, that was neat. (laughs) Come sit here and be bored and just worship me. There's so much more he has planned for you, and it is amazing. John MacArthur explains it like this. I love this. He says, the concept of a city should be your first clue. The fact that God refers to it as a city indicates relationships, activities, responsibilities, unity, socializing, communion, cooperation, unlike the evil cities that we know of now in the present earth. We will be perfect, holy, glorified people. Therefore, we in the New Jerusalem can live and work together and have fun in perfect harmony. That's incredible. What a beautiful way to put it. Each one of us has our own purpose and design that God has called us, and we will share unbroken fellowship with him and countless millions, and it is going to be awesome, but I'm going to run out of time, so i got to get to some new nuggets that I just learned this week, and I can't wait to bring them. The best part is going to be seeing Jesus face-to-face and hearing what he says to you. After the Bema seat, after the rewards are given, and we talked about the five crowns last time, and I don't have time to get into that. I want to share something brand new that we gloss over and we read, and we, we might touch on it in a Bible study and go, oh, I think I've heard about that. But there's this little verse hidden in Revelation chapter 2 that I want to direct your attention to. It's Revelation 2.17, and it says this right here. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This was written originally to the churches in uh, Pergamos, so keep it in context. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. What on earth does that mean, right? We're kind of familiar with that manna. We hear about it. We know that God provided miraculously and fed the children of Israel this awesome wafer, this, this, this heavenly bread that would show up and they would eat it. And like, what is this? Let's call it manna. And, and they have this, this incredible recognition of God as our provider for a while. And then they kind of get complaining because we don't ever do that. And then we see that Jesus comes along and he actually refers to himself as the bread of life. In fact, he talks about it when we take communion. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then we talk about, there's priests that talk about it. And in my Hebraic prophetic study Bible, it talks about on the seventh day, the priests are allowed to go in, and they can eat the bread off the table of showbread, and they can, they can have a reminder of how God will provide. So we're kind of vaguely familiar with the whole manna thing, but then we get to this white stone, and we think, what is that? Is that like some place where you make bread, or is that like a cold stone where you can have awesome ice cream? And we're not really sure what it is, and we kind of gloss over it, right? Oh, context is everything. Do you know what this meant in this day? Jesus was very familiar with the white stones. In Roman culture, the white stones were given to victorious soldiers coming home or to victorious athletes. Sometimes they even called them victory stones. And when they won something, they were given this white stone, and on the stone was inscribed their name. It was their trophy. And they could take this, but it wasn't just to put it on your shelf and go, look at my rock. It gave them access to unseen treasures that only they could as victorious overcomers. They could go in and they would have special housing that only they could enjoy, special food waiting for them at a banquet. This almost almost sounds like the Olympic Village, right? Where they can go and have their their special place and they can go and all the greatest athletes of the world go and they have their parties and I know there's some crazy stuff that happens there, so maybe that's a bad illustration. Take that back, don't worry about that one. And they're sitting there and they have this white stone and they have all these victories and all these special things, housing and other benefits. When you had a special guest come to your house, if you were wealthy, you would give them a white stone. And on this white stone, you would write a special message of welcome. You would hand it to them. It would be a special bond just between you and the one you give it to. And only you two would know about it. And it was their way of saying, you are welcome. You have free reign of my house. See where this is going? Oh, wait for this. Check this out. See if you don't recognize this judicial transaction that happens right here. In matters of justice, if a criminal was pardoned, and he had his slate wiped clean, and he was forgiven, the judge would hand them a white stone. If he was guilty, he didn't get a white stone. In fact, sometimes they even gave him a black stone, so he would force to carry this around. I'm guilty. Now, imagine what happens. This is so powerful. When the priest of the temple, after being examined, he gives a pardon. He gives a white stone of sanctuary that gives them now access to the temple that they didn't have before. There's so much powerful symbolism here, y'all. Check this out. 
Now with this white stone, this overcomer is identified as guiltless, as pardoned, as made clean, as now worthy and approved to enter the heavenly city, to fully enjoy the delights and all the benefits of the new kingdom. Now do you see the symbolism of that? The idea of a new name, that's mentioned twice in Isaiah, and I don't have time to go into all that. And then it's talked about that there is a special book. And if you were confessed before the Sanhedrin as a clean, did you pass the test for priesthood? You were given white garments and a white stone, and you could peruse the temple at your leisure, but your name was now inscribed in a special registry. And it is awesome. There's a special registry mentioned here in Revelation that I've purposely held back till now. And that is the Lamb's Book of Life. It is known as the official registry of heaven, and it's actually mentioned a few times elsewhere, but every time it is, its emphasis is always on how important it is. Jesus himself actually mentions something similar in Luke. He says, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. I mean, that's cool that you can cast out demons, but rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. And the last time it's mentioned is right here in Revelation 21, and it says this, nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So let me ask, the elephant in the room, how certain are you that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? How certain are you that you have been recorded in the registry of heaven? I hope it is. You can be certain. You can be sure of this. In fact, I'm going to ask the musicians to go ahead and come up now. The, uh, this last story here will indicate something so powerful here. Over 100 years ago, one of my favorite preachers was the great D.L. Moody. And he told the story of a father that he met in New York. And this father had a precious son. The problem that this precious son had was he had an illness that was mysterious, and it would occasionally show up, and then it would disappear. And he would get sick for a while, and then he would kind of seem to recover, though not quite as strong as he was before. And he didn't last very many years at this point with this until finally he had a horrible turning for the worse. And his mom called in the doctors, and the doctors came over, and they said, we have missed this, but he has a disease. And this disease is terminal. And he had the heartbreaking responsibility to then look at the mother and the father and say, not only is it terminal, but because we have caught this so late, I'm so sorry, your son will likely not last a few more days. They wept together. They cried. Two more days go by. The father comes home from work. And before he goes into his son's room, he sees his wife, and his wife is just red-faced. And she, tears are streaming down her face, and he says, what's wrong? She said, our sweet boy has taken a turn for the worse today, and he is gravely ill. The doctor's already come, and he said that it's, it's so terminal, he doesn't think he will last through the night. Well, this hit the father hard. He walked into his son's bedroom, and he opened the door, and there was his son smiling. Through the pain, through all the, the anguish, and the dad knew exactly what was happening. And he looked at his son, and he said instantly he was aware that his son was also fully aware what was about to happen to him. In fact, his exact words were this. As he looked at his dad, he said, Daddy, will I be with Jesus tonight? I feel like I am. And the father, being candidly honest with him, said, Son, it is very likely that you are going to be with Jesus tonight. And as the father spoke, he broke down and the tears streamed down his face. And he said he did his best to hide them from his boy. But his boy caught him and said, don't. Don't hide them, but don't cry for me. Dad, I am about to go to heaven. And when I get there, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go straight to Jesus, whom you've told me about my whole life. And I'm going to thank him that you were in my life and that you told me since I could remember how to get to this moment. That changed everything for his father. Just a few hours later, his son was in the arms of Jesus. He slipped from this life into the life that really matters. For the Christian, for the believer, there is no goodbye. There is just, I will see you later. I will see you on the other side like a ship that we see on the horizon that disappears from our sight and we say, there it goes. But somebody on the other shore is looking and says, there it comes. 
here it comes. It's here. Some of us have sent on loved ones ahead. Some of us have been there. Some of us are watching our loved ones make that transition even now. There is no goodbye. There's only see you later. Because of what Jesus accomplished on that cross, he has allowed us the privilege to have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But we have to take the step. You must RSVP. Only you can make the decision to repent of your sins. I know repentance is not a popular word anymore. Sins is an even less popular word. It's not about praying a simple prayer. Notice that no time will I ever say, ask Jesus into your heart, because we simplify it too much, I think. And this, is a, this is a surrendering to the Holy Spirit. If you have not done that, you can do that today. This is where you admit with God and you agree with him on the hideousness of our sin, that we've blown it, that we are fallen. Lord, you have, you have shown me in your word that I am separated from you and I need your forgiveness. I need the blood of the lamb to cleanse me from sin. I want to be where I take myself off the throne of my heart. Holy Spirit, you invade every part of me and you take over. You are in the driver's seat. Have you done that? Because you can today. Perhaps you've done it, but you've never confessed him as Lord in front of others. You need to do that. If you confess me before men, he says, I'll confess you before my father. We saw a young, brave boy do that today. If you've never done that, you, you should probably do that. It's one of the two things God left for us to do after he left. Celebrate the Lord's Supper and be baptized. Maybe you want to pray for somebody that this is, this is a message for them, and you want to lift it. The altar will be open. Today, we conclude by singing and worshiping and praying no one will bother you. This is your time. The words will come up on the screen. If you're visiting with us, we sing. The altar is open. No one will bother you. Just be obedient in these next few minutes to whatever God lays on your heart. Let's stand together as we sing, as we pray. If you have a decision to make, just be obedient to the Lord.